that whole year, I think I made like 157,000. But that month, that one month, I had made like a 50K deal. And I was like, holy cow, I was 18 at the time. And for me, that was a huge win. Because not even because of the money, the money was cool. But you know, what is an 18 year old going to blow that on? It was the mindset shift. Like this is this is possible. I'm learning the skills to make this happen. And once I have those skills, I can make this happen again and again and again. Welcome to Nursing Real Wealth. I'm thrilled to have a dynamic entrepreneur with us today, Alexis Morgan. Alexis is a Georgia Tech dropout and embodies the spirit of a serial entrepreneur with a successful door knocking wholesaling real estate business under her belt already. She's also the force behind a short term lending enterprise tailored for real estate investors specializing in loans for EMD and funding for fix and flips. Together with her partner, uh, Abraham Gray, Alexis has transacted over $100 million in private money loans. Alexis is already known as a master negotiator, connector, and networking expert, turning every handshake into a valuable connection and a business uh, opportunity. Stay tuned as we unpack the incredible journey of Alexis Morgan. Oh, and did I mention she just turned 20? Alexis, <laughs> uh, I, I am really looking wow. forward to our discussion today. Uh, oh, welcome. Wow. Thank you, Justin. That was quite an intro. Wow, I'm, I love that. I, I love it. I mean, I'm just listening to that. It makes two years feel like a decade long. <laughs> right. I love it. Well, I love the fact that you've been at this for two years and there's a lot to, a lot to share already. Yeah. Um, let's start with um, the, the very beginning of this journey. Obviously, it sounds to me like you kind of took the standard approach or the standard ride and you went down the road of I got to go through college. Something clicked though, right? Yeah. And and it's and, and a switch went off, and you went the other way. How yeah. about you tell people about that? Yeah, it, I mean, when I first started, I was totally traditional. I was going to school, getting good grades, had a great GPA, um, and I always wanted to go to the best schools. I was going to be like a surgeon or, or an engineer or something along those lines. And then Corona hit. And I found through talking to a lot of people that Corona was like the blessing that they were missing on their lives for some reason. But for me, it was this period of like self-reflection. And so I started studying, you know, the richest people in the world. Growing up, my mom has a PhD in education. So spoiler alert, she wasn't happy when I dropped out of college. But she did kind of instill this, uh, this core value to always be learning, always be growing. And so when school stopped, um, I was a junior in high school and I was just like, okay, well, what am I going to do with all this free time? I started reading books, started doing some personal development. I picked up Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and I just started learning about the ways of the wealthy. And so going into my senior year and especially college, I started to face a lot of misalignment with where I wanted to go, what I wanted in terms of being wealthy, being successful, and what I was actually doing, what I was practicing. And so that went on for, I don't know, seven or eight months. And it, I just couldn't take it anymore. I didn't drop out on, on some, some prayer or, or even like some plan. I literally couldn't take it anymore. I was living a life that I was not identifying with that I knew wouldn't lead me to where I wanted to go. It was so hard. You know, imagine doing something every day, knowing that it's going nowhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Uh, well, I can totally relate to that because that's exactly what I, I, I experienced towards, uh, I, I, I wouldn't say going nowhere. Um, for me, particularly, I've been a nurse for 13 years for 11 years. I worked on the floor and it was a really rewarding career. Don't get me wrong. It was a, it was a great career serving people and helping people, uh, to the best of my ability get well. Um, I've shared a couple of times on this podcast, so I'll spare the listeners the, the full mm -hmm. story, but I, I exited nurse or, or seek to exit nursing, um, and, and do, um, entrepreneurial work, um, investing and, in, in getting into real estate primarily, ironically, because of, uh, uh, COVID as well. Um, the last round of COVID is what kind of woke me up. And, yeah. um, so that's, that's something you could spend a whole podcast on, but definitely, um, was, was an experience that opened my eyes to a number of things. One, um, frankly, some, uh, some things that I saw were, uh, the corruption of, of our government and how it, um, controls so much, um, all the way down to basically the bedside of the nurse. 
Yeah. It controls the actions of a nurse and it controls what you can and cannot advocate for. That yeah. was unveiled in COVID. And um, the other thing that uh, it, it uh, brought to light was um, obviously we had some record inflation that was starting to show up. And I was like, wait a minute, my 401k ain't even outpacing this. Um, right. I, I'm, I'm falling behind with my yeah. money in a 401k. That is not going to work. <laughs> by by multiple percentage points, like double percentage points, I am falling behind. Um, <laughs> not cool. And uh, so that was that was the wake up call for me. But yeah, um, how about could could you just share some maybe some key milestones that you set for yourself when you went on this journey that you've achieved um, from some of your past ventures. Um, such as the wholesaling and also the short-term lending. Yeah, I think when, when I started, um, I set more intentions rather than these hardcore goals. I think I'm fortunate to say that when I started, I wasn't in the mindset of, I need this to happen quickly. I was actually super patient and I was like, this is the journey that, I, that I'm choosing and I know that I'm gonna get the end result that I want with being super intentional and being very consistent. And so when that's going to happen, I'm not sure, but here are my intentions. And so in the first year of entrepreneurship for me, I was so passionate about learning. I was aware of the fact that I didn't know shit. <laughs> and so I was like, I'm going to do whatever it takes to learn. So my first experience in entrepreneurship was working under a mentor. I was closing deals for him. I was calling his leads. I was picking up his coffee. This story is not one that's super unique, right? I was doing whatever I needed to do to get around someone who, who was successful already. And so I had made some money with him because I had brought opportunities to the table because I was consistently showing up and putting in the work. And so after I made money with him, um, I took that money and I invested it into mentorship and so the money that I've made now, the deals that I've done, the intro that you made for me, all of that has come from consistently and aggressively investing in mentorship. You know, it's been two years. It hasn't been long. I, I am excited and shocked and nervous for what I'll achieve in 20 years because I'm always aggressively looking for the next best player and to learn from the next best player. So when I first started, you know, I made 50K in a month. That was like the most money I'd ever made in a month. That whole year, I think I made like 157,000. But that month, that one month, I had made like a 50K deal. And I was like, holy cow, I was 18 at the time. And the title company wrote me a check for, uh, for $50,000 for a wholesale deal. And for me, that was a huge win because not even because of the money. The money was cool. But, you know, what is an 18-year-old going to blow that on? It was the mindset shift. Like this is this is possible. I'm learning the skills to make this happen. And once I have those skills, I can make this happen again and again and again. I can make this predictable. So for me, that first year was about learning. This second year of entrepreneurship 2023, for me, this year was about community. I wanted to make sure now, now that I have skills, I have other people that I can teach these skills for, to or leverage these skills from to do it bigger. I want to do it bigger, always want to go bigger, go home. And so last year I learned a lot of stuff. I got exposed to a lot of new ideas. And this year, you know, I'm grateful to say that there's nothing that can come across my plate and I, ha I don't have anyone to call to take care of it or, or to help me with it or to take it to the next level. So those are sort of the, the milestones and the goals that I've set for myself. And if I'm completely honest with you, Justin, when you, when you move in this fashion, the money, it comes naturally. It just really does. Like I don't set super huge goals like, oh, I'm going to be a millionaire by 23 or 24 or 20. You know, I set very intention, uh, intention based goals. And so the money kind of happens naturally with that. I, I hope that helps. I want to be honest. Yeah, yeah. No, that's good. I like it. Um, I, I love the the choice of words. You said you, you started out with intentions versus solid goals. And there's a lot of folks that, um, uh, that, you know, particularly uh, the last guy I interviewed actually really said, you got to set specific goals. And so that's a specific, um, you know, perspective that he has. Could you kind of uh, dive into that maybe just a smidge, um, the, the difference between an intention and the goal in your mindset? Yeah, yeah, you know, where for they're, sure. Where they're, so, where they're valuable. Yeah, so an intention is going to help you when you're, when you're networking or talking to someone. And an intention is going to help you figure out actually – what, what it is that you need to do, right? So if, if you're if you're trying to do a real estate deal and you're in, your goal is to make $100,000, right? 
your intention needs to be like, how am I going to make this money? Who am I going to make this money with? Uh, it's sort of these like branches off the goal is the way that I look at intention. What is it? What is this money going to feel like when it comes to me? And so when you start experiencing some of those things that people don't normally think about, they just say, okay, I'm going to make a hundred thousand dollars. And then they try to think their way into the hundred thousand dollars and they, they get frustrated when they don't hit the goal or they can't immediately identify the opportunity. Whereas for me, I'll, I'll say, okay, you know, let's say I want a hundred thousand dollars. Well, who, the first question I'm asking myself is who already has this money? That's always the first question that comes to mind. Who already has this money? Um, what are they doing? Um, what is it going to feel like for me to make this money? What opportunity can I add to that person that already has it in order for me to make that money with them? Because you're never going to make a single dollar without someone else involved in the transaction. I try to do a lot of things at once. And what I mean by that is at the same time I'm making a deal, I want to build a relationship. At the same time I want to build a relationship, I want to pull out my camera. So I'm also filming content. At the same time I'm doing all three of those, I want to practice my negotiation and communication skills. So I'm trying to I'm trying to cultivate opportunities that allow me to practice a lot of different skills at one time. <laughs> love it. So I, I love that. a goal is like hardcore, you know, a goal for me is like super logical and they are needed for sure. But there's also this femininity side to goal setting, which is like, oh, what, like what? It, what is this going to do for me? What does it feel like? Who do I want to work with on this? So it's like sort of a masculine, feminine way of looking at goals and, and achievements. Hmm, that's an interesting way of putting it. It's a very interesting uh, perspective. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. You're asking questions no one ever asked me before. Oh, cool. I like that too. <laughs> Let me ask you this. Um, so looking ahead, um, what goals? will you achieve in the next five years or whatever time frame you kind of want to go with? Yeah. Um, just depends on what you're setting for yourself, but just, yeah. What are you, what are you yeah, looking so to achieve? Something that a lot of people don't know about me, Justin, is that I don't own any real estate property. And you know that my personal mentor is Abraham Gray, who's this huge advocate of buying and selling businesses. So for me, I have three cash flowing companies. That's amazing. And so for me over the next five years, my big goal is to roll up a bunch of uh, companies. This is like now I'm getting a, a couple private equity terms. So I'm sorry if it gets a little bit confusing. But basically, you go out and buy these small businesses and you brand them as one brand. You create systems and processes that unite them. And so all of a sudden, you're the little mon uh, neighborhood monopoly for this one industry. And when you do that and you do that very strategically, you can sell these businesses at a multiple for their profit. So real estate, you can't, real estate is worth what it's worth, right? And so I cut my teeth in real estate. I started in real estate. I will always have respect for real estate for the reasons of you can do it when you're getting started. And many people do it when they're billionaires and have to save on taxes. It's like this long, long cycle of success. Big fan of real estate. That's a podcast for another day. But where I really have fun is in team building and business buying and, and really learning how to cultivate a culture inside of a company. You know, with my wholesale company, I've had the pleasure of working with people and, and watching people grow and get their first deal or their first couple deals with the company. And there's nothing that makes me happier than seeing someone enjoy hanging out with a team, seeing someone excited to learn, seeing someone returning and, and see, seeing them being poured into and just enjoying it. So in the next five years, my goal is to continue to buy up all these companies, roll them up into one entity and make a big, you know, 50, $60 million exit to private equity. Then I'll use th those funds to carry me on to a billion, but you got to start somewhere, right? <laughs> Love it. You, you mentioned earlier, um, that no one really makes money without someone else involved. Mm -hmm that's a concept that, um, you know, when I fantasize about entrepreneurship, but hadn't actually taken action, uh, it never occurred to me. Mm. It's funny how that happens. Right. Um, but it wasn't until I got under mentorship with Pace Morvian that I started recognizing community is key. Like you are going to really struggle. Um, you might be able to make some good money without, um, involving too many people, but you're not going to be able to scale. Nope. Um, so networking is obviously really a chief cornerstone in entrepreneurship and real estate, whatever you're getting into. So what strategies do you employ 
to build relationships? And then how do you ensure that your relationships remain strong and then fruitful in the long run? Yeah, I think one thing that I, I want to highlight here when it comes to networking is similar to anything else in business, it's a numbers game. So I've probably shaken thousands of hands and I can call hundreds, maybe even less, you know, my friends and, and people I do business with. But um, when it comes to networking, doing it very strategically is important. And so when I started, I remember when I started, Justin, I tried to network and pitch creative finance to like a fix and flipper. And the guy literally looked me in, dead in the eyes and he was like, he was like, I don't see how that works for me. And he walked away. So like, it's not always going to be successful, your networking. <laughs> so I, I went through a lot of trials and error, errors. And now I've come to a place where, you know, I can typically get someone to want to do business with me or, or want to continue to have a conversation depending on who I'm talking to. And I still make mistakes, but Either way, strategically networking is something that I practice. You know, I'm not I'm not ever going to an event or uh, an outing without a specific intention. Even if my intention is literally just to meet new people, you know, I'm always going to make that clear before I in a place myself in that environment. I'm super huge on stuff like this, like energy and intentionality. I'm not going to do something without knowing why I'm doing it. And maybe that comes from my college days. Like why, that, that might have stuck to me. That might have been the trauma that I picked up when I went through that period. I don't do anything now without knowing exactly why I'm doing it, or at least it's, it's very hard for me too. Um, so when I'm networking with people, the main thing that I'm asking is, you know, how'd you get started? Where do you want to go? And why aren't you there yet? Those are the three questions that I'm asking. Because with those questions, I can understand a little bit of background, have an opportunity to build a relationship, maybe find somewhere where we relate to each other, um, where you want to go. I'm, I'm searching for an aligned vision, searching if there's any potential to, to go somewhere together, searching for their goals, seeing if they've set goals. You know, you ask many people, what do they want? And they just can tell you what they don't want. They can never tell you what they want. They just continue harping on complaining on what they don't want, how hard it is, whatever the case may be. So I'm always looking for an aligned vision. Hey, where, do you, where are you trying to go? So, you know, what did you take away from this event? What are you going to apply? You know, what's, what does it look like for you in 12 months? What does it look like you, for you in five years? These are questions that I constantly ask when networking. And then the last question that I ask is, you know, what's stopping you from getting there? You know, if, if you had to guess between time, money, capital, and resources or knowledge, you know, what, what do you feel like is the biggest gap missing right now? And so since I've practiced this networking so many times, I can usually fill the gap, but it took a lot of reps to know who to call for what, right? So that's, that's kind of how, you know, there's a lot of other questions and sometimes I'll get caught up in like a, a conversation where you're just having genuine curiosity and you can keep asking questions. But when I'm networking with people at any event, that's sort of the framework that I follow to see if there's any potential to do business together. It's very strategic. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, that's really great. Um, I'm actually in my in my networking. I'm actually asking a very similar set of questions, so that's um, validating. Uh, that's great to hear that. That's great. That's great. Yeah. But what I wish I knew in the beginning was if I had just done that, and I guess it's still sort of the beginning, so I'm okay. But but if if you have if you just do that, then you can be very successful. Um, I don't know if your listeners are familiar with Pace Morby, but he told a story one time, and he said he was at a networking event, and he would ask people two questions: What do you have, and what do you need? And so one guy he was talking to, he said, "What do you have, and what do you need?" He, the guy goes, I have a million dollars and I really don't know what to do with it. I don't want it to sit in the bank. And the, and Pace goes, man, that, I'll, like, I'll let you know if I come up with something. He turns to literally turns to the other shoulder and he asks the next guy, what do you have and what do you need? He, he goes, I have a deal that needs a million dollars. Like, that's what I have and that's what I need. And Pace like connects the two and steps back and he gets, he makes money off of that transaction, whether it's a wholesale fee, a connector fee or retaining equity and whatever, you know, whatever came out of it. There's money to be to be made, big money to be made by just connecting people. So there are lots of people that focus on strategically networking and, and managing their relationships. Yeah, that is currently exactly what I'm spending my time doing. I'm learning Good. to be a connector um, specifically for private money, but um, very you know open to as I find and discover people connecting other needs with um, with wants, <laughs> you know, so good, good. I love uh, it. yeah. Um, 
Can you, can you tell me a little bit about maybe a specific instance where networking for you played a pivotal role in your success or business growth? Well, I think that would be when I started. Um, so the week after I dropped out of college, it was, it was December, 2021. And I dropped out of college. I actually took a leave of absence. So I, I didn't say that I was dropping out, but obviously I never went back. So, <laughs> so I guess that makes me a dropout. <laughs> but um, the week after I dropped out of college, and this is where resourcefulness comes in, comes in. You know, entrepreneurs are resourceful human beings. I literally looked up on Google. I wasn't going to wait for some golden opportunity to come to me in real estate. I wasn't going to, you know, see what I could do or, or try to figure it out on my own. I Googled on my uh, computer. I lived in Orlando at the time. I'm Atlanta based now. I said, Orlando real estate meetup. And I went to the first one that popped up. It wasn't super creative. It was like 50 bucks to get in, whatever. That's, that's what I call the dumb tax. I listen to a lot of people uh, on mentorship and Alex Hermosi has this one saying, which I think is great. And he says, if you're not making a million dollars a year, um, whatever, whatever it is you are making, the difference between that is how much it's costing you to not make a million dollars. So let's say that it, you're, you're trying to make a million dollars a year and you're making a hundred thousand. Well, you're paying $900,000 a year to not know how to make it. And so it, if someone's going to teach you how to make a million bucks and they're charging you 50 grand, a hundred grand, that's a small, small fee for the potential of the opportunity. So I look at these mentorships and, and masterminds. I don't even, I don't even look at the price, whatever it is that it is costs, it's usually worth it. So this is, this one event was 50 bucks to get it. And so I went to the event, I got in and I asked the lady at the front desk very intentionally, I want to be a wholesaler. I want to be a high level wholesaler. Who in this room should I be talking to? And I think that's a ninja technique that many people should use when they go out and network. There's usually a host of the event that knows the majority of the audience, that knows the majority of the attendees. And you should go ask that host before you go email that host, you know, who in this room should I be talking to based on your intention? A lot of this stuff is so confusing without intention. I see many people running around with their, their head, running around like a chicken with their head cut off because there's no intention. You can't even do the exercise that I just mentioned without having a clear intention and, and kind of getting an idea of knowing where you're going. And so this is kind of unrelated, but this past weekend I was at an event and people were asking me about this specific topic, having an intention. And I think one thing that I will say is that it's not something that comes up in five minutes. It's not even something that comes up in a month. You have to give yourself the grace to take six months to figure out what you want to do. Then you have to have the courage to pursue that. And then you have to have the humility to say, this is not what I want to do and start over. That is the journey. That literally is the journey. <laughs> so if you don't know what you're doing, that. that's okay. It doesn't come in five minutes. <laughs> yeah. I can totally relate to that. I have been through so many, so many different iterations of this real estate journey in my own, my own experience, my short lived experience so far. Um, but yeah, yeah. And you keep, like, re you keep reinventing yourself, right? It's like, yes. and you, and you do that because you're constantly growing. It's not a bad mm -hmm. thing. You're constantly being exposed to something that's going to help you get to where you want to go. Many people look at that and, and they say it's shiny object syndrome. I think sometimes it is for sure, but I, I, I can appreciate shiny object syndrome because what that allows me to do is explore all these opportunities finally take a step back and say, okay, I did X, Y, Z. I did ABC. I did that. I did that. I did that. Which one did I enjoy? And now I can make an intentional decision, a conscious decision and say, this is what is best for me. This is what I like. So I'm, I, a lot of people hate shiny object syndrome and going through it sucks. But at the end of the day, you know, my perspective now is I'm glad I tried everything. I'm glad I tasted all the, f the flavors of the rainbow because I like red and blue. I like lending and business buying. I did everything. I did everything. And I like lending and business buying. That's it. <laughs> um, well, let me ask you this. Um, could you... Could you share a little bit about your short-term lending venture that you've gotten yourself into now? You're you're doing a very unique niche. Now, there's a lot of folks that will listen that are from the Gator Network, so they're familiar with EMD. But for those who aren't, maybe you could share this niche of EMD funding as well as the short-term loans for fix and flips. Yep. 
So when I moved to Atlanta, I got into lending with my partner, Abraham. He's been lending uh, for over 20 years uh, in Atlanta. And we're very strict about where we lend, specifically on private money loans because of foreclosure laws, right? You have to be kind of educated around um, what it looks like to take back an asset. So many people, I like to compare what we do in terms of PML to mortgage companies because many people understand how a mortgage works. They put debt on the home. Once you sell the home, they get paid before you get paid. And so it works the same way with us where we're lending against assets that have no previous debt. We're the first lien position. And for these fix and flippers who will buy a distressed house, put their own money into it, fix it up, and then list it on the market, they will make money. They'll make a return on their investment. And of course, we make money because we're, we're putting a lien against it. We're loaning against it. We're offering our capital so that they can actually have the opportunity to do the project. When it comes to EMD, is such a niche product. I feel like not many people know about it at all, except in our Gator community. And that's why, you know, what we've seen across the board is that in that um, marketplace specifically, when we're doing business with people, it's a large, large education process as well. I just filmed a YouTube video today for when people do a deal with us, actually what has to happen to do a deal with us because most people don't understand, you know, the business model as a whole. So EMD lending, let's talk about wholesalers. So if you guys aren't familiar with wholesalers, what wholesalers will do, they'll find a very distressed house. They will make an offer on it. Let's say make an offer at a hundred thousand and then they'll turn around and sell that same house after the offer is accepted, of course, for maybe 120,000, 130,000. And they'll sell it without ever putting any money into it without sometimes without ever even seeing it. They'll sell it to a fix and flipper, someone who, you know, we, we might lend to at the end of the day, <laughs> but the fix and flipper is going to put their own money into it. The wholesaler is not, they're largely a marketing company. And so when a wholesaler gets a property under contract, not only are they curious about where they're going to find that 100000 but once they get it under contract, the, the uh, seller of the house requests an earnest money deposit. This is a small amount of money, usually like 1% to 5% of the total purchase price that goes into the escrow company to, to make sure that the wholesaler is legit. You know, if, if the wholesaler says, I'm going to buy the house for 100000 and the seller says yes, the guy doesn't just hand her a hundred thousand and, and she or he hands him the keys. There's a third party who kind of handles that transaction. And so the, the third party is called title and escrow and they will hold that earnest money. The problem with wholesalers is that once they make that 20 or 30 grand spread, they'll go blow it right away. They, they're not super, you know, most of the time, I don't want to blanket cover wholesalers, but most of the time they somehow have no funds to, to, to fund their own EMD. And so as EMD lenders, Justin as well, your EMD lender, we'll say, okay, you know, this is kind of risky for us. We'll fund your EMD. We do have ways to protect our money, of course. We're not doing this like willy-nilly, but we'll fund your EMD. We'll put 2000 5000 whatever the number is in escrow. But for that, we're going to take a big chunk of that assignment fee. We're not just going to take 8%. We're not just going to take 10%, 12%, 15%. You know, these kind of casual returns that you see in, in, more often in investments. We're going to take a huge chunk of, of that uh, assignment fee, that, that 20 or 30 grand spread. So you see Gators funding EMD for, for 30 days, the length of the transaction. And at the closing table, not only do they get their five grand back, but they get an additional five grand or they get an additional 10 grand. Sometimes you see they get 2,500 or whatever the case may be, but more often than not, you know, Gators are making a, a huge chunk of, of profits off of the EMD funding. Nice. How many of those are we, are you typically doing per week or per month? Yeah, we probably fund, I would say two to three uh, EMDs uh, a week and we get a ton, we get a ton more requests. The problem is that not all these deals are super uh, good, you know, the problem with EMD is that it's at the very beginning of the transaction. So we also do the double close where we'll fund the, the end buyer and, and do the A to B and B to C. A lot of, a lot of terminology that has to be explained if I go into that. But, um, but you know, not every deal is a good deal. And so we try to field all the bullshit, quote unquote, that we don't think is going to make it to close of escrow. So we get a ton of requests, um, but we end up only funding like two or three a week. And we, we do collect an, an up for those of you guys that are gators out there, I highly encourage you to collect an upfront deposit. You know, when I started, I mentioned I work for a mentor closing his deals. 
that mentor was doing a million a month in wholesale real estate. And still the KPI that is tried and true, one out of every three deals would go to closing, which means two out of three would cancel. It's a, it's a wholesale standard. I, I watched it happen for a guy who was very, very successful. So you have to be careful when you're doing EMD lending to, to collect an upfront deposit because just out of the KPIs of the business model, not every deal is going to make it to closing. And so you don't want to have your money out there for 30 days and the deal cancels and you have nothing nothing to show for it, right? A lot of people and pay lot, fire fees. They're paying interest. Lots of fire fees. Yeah, exactly. So you want to collect an upfront deposit on that money and just hedge against you know your protection of the deal canceling. Yeah. What, what do you... So... Um, I know some people are hesitant to do that because um, they don't like the idea of upfront money. You know, like wholesalers don't like the idea of giving an upfront fee because it feels yeah. scammy. Yeah. Um, to them, what 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 are your <laughs> yeah, what is your response to that? How do people get around that? Yeah, I mean, in in that scenario, a lot of the times you guys probably are going to like this answer, but a lot of times it's the way that that we present ourselves. It's not something that we're willing to to move on. Um, but if we did have one scenario where this guy was like, you know, screw you guys, I'm not going to work with you. And so we work with him to have that money sent to the title company. Remember that third party I mentioned, he sent his money to the title company. We sent our escrow to the title company. And as soon as we sent our escrow, he, you know, we got, we got an agreement in place that the title company would release his deposit to us. And so that's the one that's literally only happened out of like one out of a hundred deals we funded, for example, but in that scenario, that is a way to handle it. Hey, send your upfront deposit to the title company. Like they're not going to release it if I'm not legit. Like that's their job to make sure I'm legit. So let me send your money there. I'll send my money there. Once my money's there, you know, your deposit comes to me and we can move forward with the deal. So that's, that's kind Love of it. how I handle it. Love it. Yep. No, that's great. That, that's the <laughs> a, a curiosity for you yourself, Justin. <laughs> What's that? That seemed like a curious question for yourself. It, it is a curious question for myself. I think I had I had a I had a notion of how that could be done, but uh, it was it was uh, I've seen a few different answers to that over over the course of time in the Gator Network. Yeah. So there's definitely an ongoing. I mean, I just I don't Network. understand Gators that don't charge it though. There are a couple Gators yeah. that I know that aren't charging it, and I don't understand that risk. But I mean, it, people yeah. people just they have they have more risk tolerance at sometimes. So. Yeah. Well, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me to go and risk money out um, with a with at least a one and uh, with at least a uh, what did you say a two and three chance of losing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and that's that's just the industry. that's wholesaling. If you go to any high level wholesaler, they will tell you they'll tell you yeah. like half of our deals never make it to closing. Sure, it's industry standard. Yeah. Yep. It's not even anything with e, it, with our lending model or anything. It's just mm-hmm. like wholesaling. These are distressed assets. They don't sell to anyone else for a reason, right? <laughs> right. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's really good. Um, what are some of the challenges that you've faced in the lending space, and then how have you overcome them? Hmm. Challenges in the so I guess with with Gator lending specifically, the the communication with title is really your security. You know, when we do PML our loans are backed by an asset. If the borrower were to walk out of their office, walk out of the property that they're fixing and flipping with our money still tied up in the deal, we have a lien. This guy, this guy just disappears. He goes to Mexico or maybe he gets abducted by aliens. We can foreclose on that asset and claim it in, uh, in 60 days and sell it the next day and make money. No problem. Without this guy ever giving his check mark of approval, he's just gone. But since we are a lien against the asset, we can take it back. In gator lending, it's a little bit different. You know, we're not filing any security deeds. We're not filing any liens or or necessarily like promissory notes. And so your security in gator lending is largely due to your communication with the title company. And so, oh my God, I have this crazy story, (laughs) crazy story. One of the first loans that we did, um, I think it was EMD. It was a $250,000 EMD in Florida. Yeah, it was pretty large. And so we, our company policy is to always cancel the due deal, cancel the contract if it's not going to go through. If there's no buyer, you know, for the wholesaler to replace our funds. Um, if there's no buyer, we always cancel one day before the due diligence period ends because of incidents like this. Someone's out of the office. Someone's sick. Someone, you know, whatever the case may be. Title companies are slow, so we start the cancellation process, 
and we have all of our paperwork in place. We've communicated with the title company, uh, or, or so we thought. So we thought. And the title company res- we canceled the contract. Hey, can we please like our EMD back. You know, we're, we're, this contract is not moving forward. Whatever the templates say. I use templates for everything. And um, they email us back and they're like, yeah, great. Um, can someone, you know, send me the receipt that the seller has been notified that the contract is canceled? And so in EMD loans that we've done before, our, a title company says, yeah, just let us know. We'll, you know, just shoot us an email. We'll send you back your, your, your funds. This title company specifically needed a receipt that the seller received the cancellation. So this is what I mean, like where it's like it's so largely dependent on your communication with the title company. So we were like, what do you mean? We need to tell the seller that we're canceling. And then I was scrambling because we didn't have the seller's number. We didn't have the seller's email. We were only dealing with the borrower the whole transaction, only dealing with the buyer the whole transaction. So luckily we do our TC work correctly and we have the purchase and sale agreement. We look at the buyer. I'm, I'm sorry. We look at the seller. There's no, there's no email listed and there's also none, no number listed. It's just an LLC. So then we have to go through the Florida LLC uh, secretary of state. And we look at the, where this listed is as an address. We literally look at where this place is an address. And I want you to remember I'm in Atlanta, this deal is in Florida and we had to somehow notify the seller in Florida that this deal is not going through. So I'm like calling everybody in sub two in this area, like, hey, can you do me a favor? Hey, can you do me a favor? Anyway, long story short, we ended up printing out, we printed out the cancellation. I paid someone in sub two to go drive to the office, like, like on demand, like called the guy, like, hey, I need you right now. If you can't do this right now, like don't even waste my time. Like I got to call, call the next person. I paid him. I, I faxed him over. I think I sent him over the PDF and had him print it out. And then he went to the office of this place, not even open, like not, you, you know, like small businesses, it's just like some post, some like some random business or some random office, not even like open. So we pasted the, we pasted the cancellation on the front door and taped it and took a picture and sent it to title. And then they're like, <laughs> they're like, okay, <laughs> like what? Okay. at that point, you know, <laughs> that's, that's what we had. So we were making a huge fuss about, about that because we ask, we always ask, what's your process for canceling the contract? And they didn't mention that. So a lot of times it's not the stuff that you know that's going to you know mess you up. It's the stuff that you know someone forgets to mention in passing. It's the stuff that you don't know. So those are some of the risk. You know, I, I would say Gator Lending and EMD and Double Close is some of the safest loans because it is dependent on the title company communication, because your funds are not being used. They're just sitting in someone else's escrow account. However, there are some weird niche, very niche risk associated with the sort of lending that we do. Um, and, and that was, that was a unique story that I ran into <laughs> when we first, when we first were getting started. That's, that's legit. That's pretty, uh, pretty wild. Yeah. Good job of getting your money back. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, the benefit here was that we had a whole 24 extra 24 hours in, in order yeah. to figure it out, you know? And, and if I could mention you had community, cause you mentioned you called up sub two. Yes. Yes. These, these may or may not have been people that you physically personally knew, right? No, they weren't. I was just like, they weren't people that you knew. No. You just knew that they were in your community and they were around that area. And See, that's why it's important. Yeah. That's that's great. Yeah. Sub two is in a great community. If you don't know what it is, you gotta go look it up. Yeah, I'm actually um, wearing the sweatshirt right now. Hey, there we go. Yep. <laughs> I like it. I yeah. like it. What are what are some key principles? You mentioned security. Obviously, there's different security for EMD, but let's talk private money. Uh-huh. What are some key principles of protecting your capital and private money that you guys employ? Yeah. It's be, I think, a little bit more beneficial to the folks in the audience who are actually looking at doing private money or are doing it, but maybe would like to to know some additional measures of security that you take. Yeah, I mean, Abraham and I host host Zooms on, on private money all the time um, because yeah. we don't want anyone to lose money. We've seen a lot of people do it incorrectly, and so we very freely give out our knowledge on what we're doing to never lose money. Um, one of the most important things that I can say about PML and where I see a lot of newbies go wrong is that they don't go through the title company. They sort of get the documents that they have an idea they should get that promissory note, that security deed, but their borrower just draws it up for them. And so it's pretty much worthless if no one's actually filed it. And the only person that can file it legally 
is the, the title company. The only person that can do it correctly is the title company or the closing attorney. So whenever you're dealing with um, a private money loan, whether it be first position or second position, Abraham and I are not fans of second position because <laughs> uh, there's there's less uh, flexibility on reclaiming that asset. You're, you're not first. You're not the first one to get paid. Um, but a lot of people where I see them go wrong is they have their borrower draw up the promissory note. They have their borrower draw up the security deed and they sign and then they wire money directly to the borrower. Absolutely no, no. Huge red flag. Um, you, you have no real real protection. There's no real security if none of these documents have been filed and kept um, with, the, with the county or, or formally secured against the asset. So that's the number one thing that I would say. The second thing that I would say where I see a lot of people make mistakes is they're trying to lend on real estate and they don't necessarily know how to value real estate. They don't know the market that they're lending in. And so Abraham and I are very particular about where we lend, which is in within 50 miles of Atlanta when it comes to PML, because we know this, this market backwards and forwards. We know when we see a property and they're asking for XYZ number, if it's too much or if it's a killer deal, right? And so I feel like that's an important muscle that I see a lot of PMLs not work on. You know, maybe they do go through the title company, but if you're over leveraged and the asset doesn't, the property doesn't sell for as much as the borrower thought it would sell for, you're still at risk uh, of losing money. Um, and so, you know, those are, there's a lot of other things that I could go through. We could spend a whole hour here, you know, talking about how to protect your money. Um, but those are the two main things that I feel like, you know, we harp on a lot, go through the title company, get a promissory note, get a security deed with the title company, get those, those things filed, lenders, insurance, property insurance, those things are important as well. And then, you know, know your market or, you know, work with an experienced operator, work with Justin, work with me, work with someone who's maybe done it before or can give you, give you the ropes, guide you along the way. Um, because, Lending money is no joke. I mean, people spend decades to save up $150,000. And I, I have been so shocked in the way that they'll send, you know, they'll send the whole amount without really doing their due diligence on a deal. So it's, it's super, it's something that's like super close to my heart because I've sat down with people who are asking me for advice when it's far too late. So I try to host as many, as many Zooms on this. I try to do as many YouTube videos my at is here. Like if you guys look at my content, this is what we're talking about lately because we're huge on lending. We're doing a ton of lending. You know, Justin, you know, we have a fund now in Atlanta. So it's, it's something for us that we just want to educate people about. We want people to do it correctly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Go follow Alexis on, on Instagram. That's her, her <laughs> at symbol there. Make sure you follow her. Good content. Um, we're getting into like just, just general, the entrepreneurial, the, the risks of doing entrepreneurship. Sure. You know? Yeah. Um, there are a lot of risk. <laughs> yeah. How do you navigate sort of those inherent risks and, you know, can you share your insights uh, yeah. into the, I think particularly what I'm interested in is the mindset shift and the courage that it takes to embrace those risks in the journey. Yeah. So there are two things, two things here that I'll say. One of them, I have, I definitely have a strategic advantage and I don't want anyone, I don't want this to discourage anyone because if you're in the same situation as me, you also have a strategic advantage. And that advantage is that I have no kids and no spouse. Like there, if anyone's going to go broke, it's only me. If anyone's not going to eat dinner, it's only me. If, if anyone's going to lose everything or win everything, it's only me. And so if you're listening and you have no commitments, you have no hard commitments, you sort of have the freedom to do whatever the f you want to do, right? Once you have a family, you have more things to consider. It's not as easy to just, you know, I moved to Atlanta in three days. I moved to Atlanta in three days notice. I did a deal with Abraham. He said, Alexis, we can do a ton more deals. If you move to Atlanta, I was like, done, I'm gone. But if you have a family, you can't necessarily do that. So that's the one thing. That's the one strategic advantage I have. Because a lot of people have asked me this. How do I, how am I the person that I am? And I'm just like, I have this like super weapon of no real commitments. <laughs> but the second thing, Justin, that I would say is that, you know, I'm sort of motivated by a, a bigger, bigger purpose. And what I mean by that, that sounds so cliche, but what I mean by that is you can't change, you can't change your community with $500,000. You can't change your community with a million dollars. 
if if we're in the re- if I am in the reasons in this entrepreneurship journey for the reasons that I say I am, which is to impact the world, impact children, raise education, then I have to go big. And so wins or losses, small wins or losses today almost mean nothing to me in the long run. You know, I'm not here to make $500,000 and kick my feet up. I'm not here to make $10 million and kick my feet up. I'm here to impact this place. I'm here to leave the world a better place than I found it. And so for me, going for billions makes sense. For other people, it may be not. Maybe they just want to change their family. Maybe they just want to impact their family. And that's totally fine. But knowing what your goal is and having that motivate you, you know, as, as you're waking up every single day, you're not, you're not getting any younger, right? So you can either take the actions to get the outputs that you want or not. You know, I, I try not to focus as much on the specific goal, but the actions that are going to get me to that goal. So rather than saying, I want to make a hundred thousand dollars, I want to, I want to make a hundred calls today because if I make a hundred calls, it's almost impossible for me to not make the money. You know, I want to make it very hard for me to not be successful. So I'm constantly doing, doing stuff like that. So when it comes to navigating the risk, I'm motivated by the goals and I'm not afraid to make little small mistakes, losses today, because in the long run, it's going to take me to, to the achievement that I want to get. And plus, you know, the difference between winners and losers is just that the winners didn't quit. Everyone loses. Everyone, everyone gets slapped in the face. Everyone hits their head on the wall. Everyone trips up and falls. It's, it's literally just a part of the journey and it's like God testing you to say, okay, do you really want it? You know, do you really want it? <laughs> so that's the way that I look at mm-hmm. it. Oh, that's great. I also love your motivation for why you're pursuing wealth. Um, I wish we could go and talk even more about that. Um, I think that would be a great podcast to, to get into. Yeah. Um, that's, 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 that's a topic dear to my heart. Um, but I want to keep rolling because, um, we're nearing the end of our time here and I got a few more questions I want to definitely get into. Um, you, you obviously when you get into this business buying, we're kind of shifting gears into that. Um, and when you're working on these larger deals, you're working with teams. And so you're working with a lot of, um, folks who are going to be working for you. Mm -hmm. Um, and you've achieved a lot of success that I think a lot of other folks would like to, but are maybe held back because of one thing they haven't developed the skill to manage teams. Mm. So as a young leader, what advice do you have for aspiring entrepreneurs um, in terms of leadership and becoming a person that others want to work for? Yeah, that's a great, great perspective. This is actually something that's near and dear to my heart because it's allowed me to kind of elevate very quickly, you know, the ability to manage people. It is, it is a core skill set for business. It is a core skill set for entrepreneurship or doing anything big. And so what came to mind immediately was charisma. And what I mean by that is, is being personal enough to have people like you, have people want to work for you, have people be inspired by you, and being smart enough to know that it's not just that. <laughs> that it's not just, let's have a good time. Let's all hang out. Because I see a lot, like my dad hires friends and family and I'm asking him about the systems and processes for hiring, and he has none. And and now it makes sense why he gets a call every time someone doesn't know how to do anything, right? So when it comes to managing teams and, and really, you know, um, getting to a place where you're a good leader, I do think there's two parts of it. The first part is, am I someone that people want to follow? Am I an inspiring leader? Um, Do I have the ability to attract people in my life who want to hang out with me, who want to do business with me? That's the first step. Without that, I think the second one is a little bit less um, meaningful. But the second step to that is, okay, now these people are here. I'm responsible for them. I need to acquire skill sets to be able to manage them properly. How am I doing at keeping people motivated? How am I doing at not only keeping people motivated, but keeping them accountable for what they said they were going to do? How's the productivity level in this business? And so I read a lot, I read a lot of books. Um, I mentioned in the beginning, I'm a constant learner. And so one of the books that helped me uh, manage teams is Traction by Gina Wickman. I also studied Layla Hormozzi a lot, how she hires and fires people, how she manages her team. And I'm, I'm not even close to the level that they do it. But what I can tell you is that their systems definitely help, their frameworks help. Um, the reason why I spend so much money on education and mentorship and even spend time and energy on, on YouTube videos like Layla Hormozzi or, or reading books like Gina Wickman, 
not only because they they uh, teach you a certain thing, but it's sort of like once you hear what you've heard, you can't unhear it. Once you've seen what you've seen, you can't unsee it. And so when you know a better, when you know better, you do better. Even if you haven't mastered it, since you've been exposed to the information, something happens in your subconscious mind where you start to try to implement it. Whether it's perfect or not, since you've seen it, since you've been exposed to it, you can kind of start to try to implement it. So when it comes to leaders and and managing teams, those are my kind of two takes on it. Number one, am I someone that people want to follow? That's kind of first, right? Have people shown interest in working with me? If not, I would fix that problem first. Number two is, okay, people want to work with me. How do I manage these people? Because I can't always be everywhere all the time. Um, So that's kind of the way that I've looked at it and the way that I built it out for myself. And I have a long way to go. Always I'm saying that. I'm 20 years old. I have a a long way to go. I hope we can do another podcast when I'm 40. I'm I'm sure I'll be much more wise then, but uh, (laughs) I am am figuring it out. (laughs) I love it. No, that's really excellent. You you raised the just an excellent point of um i think i think one of the things that i i like the most that you say is just the the fact that you need to be somebody who's worthy of being followed yes um there's a lot of leaders that aren't yeah um i've definitely encountered plenty um in my my career as a nurse um leaders who are lazy or leaders who don't care about their team um or leaders who just don't have very uh, interesting personalities, frankly, yeah. they're, just, they're just not, they're not inspiring at all. Yep. Um, and so that's really, that's, that's critical. Yeah. Excellent. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Justin. From one leader to another. Great <laughs> job. Yes. Um, let me just, uh, I'm going to cut through a couple of these cause I want to make sure I would be respectful of your time sure. as well, but we've got, um, you know, lead generation, obviously that's a really, critical part of, of really any, any part of part, part of, um, entrepreneurial entrepreneurship, can't talk real estate. Um, you know, and, and so, um, you know, what strategies have been most effective for you for generating your leads? Yeah. So I, when I look at my wholesale business, which we're targeting distressed assets as well, I want to work with the most highly motivated person. You know, if you have a, um, if you have a hot dog stand and you want to sell the most hot dogs, you know, should they taste better? Should they be faster? Should they be the best quality? None of that shit matters if you have a starving crowd. So what I'm looking for in my business is a starving crowd. Who needs me? Who has no option? Who who really needs to take this uh, uh, this deal? Because um, you know, when you look at wholesale as a, as a whole, you know, the the business model, we're buying houses at fifty percent of value, sixty percent of value, and so no one sells their house at that that price for fun. There's usually something going on. So I'm looking for the highest level motivation, which has been successful for me, is door knocking foreclosures. I have a door knocking team here in Atlanta. They go out and door knock these foreclosures, offer solutions, offer prices so that they can now avoid having their whole life and credit ripped away from them, losing all their equity in the property. And so we've we've been very successful with that. Um, another another uh, like totally different, different uh, chapter of lead generation would be personal branding. You know, my YouTube channel, my Instagram has afforded me a lot of opportunities that I wouldn't have had if I didn't put in the effort to look professional or or always be relevant. I've had tons of people come up to me at events and say, oh, my God, you're crushing it. And the thing is, it's not that I'm necessarily crushing it even. It's that I'm staying relevant in these in these folks head. I'm constantly building the online rapport. Uh, as my friend likes to call it, by constantly posting, staying relevant, showing people what I'm doing, sh- taking them along for the deals that I've done. So those are the two two approaches that I've had to, to lead generation. And there are tons of other strategies, but those are the ones that I have the most experience with. Yeah, that's excellent. I have found that to be the case as well in my own my own space. Uh, I'm I'm relatively new to the podcasting. When you when you really look at it, this has been going on for. I don't know, month and a half or two, something like that. Nice. Um, and already it's been uh, very beneficial because I've had people come to me. They, they recognize that I'm dealing with private money lenders. Yes. So people are coming to me and, you know, at least bringing the topic up, how could I use this in my, in my real estate work? Yes. So, yeah. The, that's other thing, the other thing that I want to highlight about personal branding and these podcasts and any video that you put online, it's, it's digital real estate. It's not, it's always going to go up. This is a clone now that is working for you 24 hours for free, sending your message, sending your vibrations, giving people an idea of who you are. 
Um, it's just, it's just ridiculous in my opinion to not be doing it. So I'm, I'm glad you have seen fruits of your, of your labor. Um, and it's just going to continue to multiply. You know, even if you stop podcasting tomorrow, these podcasts that you've done, they'll be out there forever. As long as you don't take them down, they'll constantly get more views. They'll constantly get more likes. Um, it's, it's, it's just great. I'm a big fan. If you can't tell. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I wanted to, before we close, I wanted to get into really quick gear negotiation skills. Obviously that's a key, key component of really all that you're doing, yeah. being able to negotiate with people. So, um, can you share your journey into just to kind of developing that your negotiating skill technique Absolutely. and then maybe highlighting some elements of what you believe contribute to successful negotiation? Yeah. So when I first started, I read books. <laughs> this is the secrets, secrets of everything that I do. <laughs> I go find a book on it and I use someone else's life experience to help me with my 30 minutes of reading. <laughs> but um, I read Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss. Um, I also read How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. And then after you get educated, it's all about action. So the guy that I was working for when I started from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. every single day, I was on the phones with sellers. I put in the reps to understand how does someone react when I say this? How does someone react when I say this? What does the framework, what framework of conversation works best for me? Um, what is my, my style of speaking? You know, I'm sure you've interviewed people where they're a lot more reserved than I am. I'm pretty outgoing. I'm pretty loud. I get really passionate about certain subjects. And so I try to incorporate my personality into the closing style and just be as authentic as possible. Um, but it really is it really is a framework, closing deals and, and having conversations where you have some sort of intention or goal um, at the end of it is a framework, you know. And so I not only learn that framework from the books, I then practice it over and over and over again. And once I left, you know, this company that I was working for closing deals and, and using my negotiation skills for closing deals, I started applying it to my networking. So now I network very intentionally. I'm closing someone on the idea of working with me. So that framework looks similar, right? And so I would also analyze my networking conversations. I remember that, that networking conversation that I told you about, the guy looked me dead in the eyes and walked away. All like for the first year of my networking, I would literally leave events and on my drive home or once I got home, I would go over how did my conversations go? Was someone more interested to talk to me or less interested? Did they want to do business with me or did they not? How did how would I rate the conversation in terms of how well I spoke to them, how well they spoke to me? Like I would just try to really, really analyze what went right and what went wrong. So when you're learning these skills of closing and negotiation, number one, you need to learn. You don't know anything. You need to learn the framework and you need to practice it. Then you need to go back and watch your game day footage. You need to review what went well and what didn't. And so with that, you're going to constantly get better. Um, unfortunately, there's no secret sauce. I think the reps part is a really big part of it where it's just like, do the work, have conversations, talk to people, try to get what you want. Um, a friend of mine is just getting started in sales. And so I, I recommended her to have the same books and not only practice it when she's on the phone or working, but like at home, like, how can I get what I want? How can I get this dinner instead of that dinner? How can I, you know, negotiate? Cause you can just practice. It's just, everyone's a person. You can always practice. You don't always have to be making a deal. You can always practice to see like, how do people react to my communication? Sales is effective and efficient communication. And so if you learn that skill, there's, it's just, it's just great. I mean, there's no successful person. Here's, here's what I'll say. There's no successful person that doesn't have it. I'll tell you that. <laughs> nice. Who are you looking to connect with and how can they connect with you? I am looking to connect with people who want to get into lending. Um, we have an insane opportunity right now to help people who don't know anything about it and want to get exposed to the idea of it and, and how to do it correctly. Um, I'm looking to connect with people who, uh, are passionate about whatever it is that they have going on. You know, I love, I love a person with passion. One of my best friends, he's like 53 years old. He's from Mexico. We have very little in common, but we talk every week because he, like, we're both so passionate. We're in the same rooms. We're talking to the same people. We're both excited and we don't know what we're going to collaborate on yet, but we have that same, similar energy. We have that support. So I'm always looking to connect with good hearted people who are passionate when it comes to what I can help with right away. Yes, I, I do lending. Yes, I can teach you about buying businesses. 
Um, and I'm sure there, there are countless people who know a lot more than me. So always connecting with people who are smarter than me so we can have some, some knowledge exchange. Um, every single person I meet, I, I learn from. So I'm, I'm excited. Thank you for having me on, Justin. And it's been a pleasure to talk to your audience and talk to you this whole time. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for joining. I appreciate it. If you are a, a person that's got extra capital and you don't know what to do with it, um, hit this girl up uh, because they're, they're opening up a fund that is uh, potentially a really excellent opportunity for you to consider um, allowing your, your capital to work a lot better and a lot more profitably than the mm-hmm. stock market will ever be able to do for you. Yeah. By folks who are very experienced with a partner who's done private money lending for over 20 years, as she said. So definitely something to to uh, to look into if you are a listener wondering what to do with that extra capital. Um, Alexis, thank you so much for, for, for joining us. Uh, to our listeners, thank you for tuning in. To those of you who are looking for ways to change the financial landscape of your future, I hope Alexis's journey has inspired you. Folks, She's already transformed her future or her present and future financial trajectory with replicable principles of mindset and self-development. If you're compelled to create a better future for yourself and your family, let Alexis's journey compel you to pursue that. Remember in the pursuit of a brighter future, investing in your self-development and nurturing meaningful relationships are key currencies that appreciate over time. Once again, thank you for listening, and I look forward to continuing this enriching journey with you in future episodes of Nursing Real Wealth. Have a great day.